In this episode of Idea City, for every barrel of oil that's produced, three barrels of water are so destroyed that they're held in great big poison holding tanks. And they're so poisonous that if a, a, a aquatic life, the ducks or the geese or anything land on them, they die immediately because we are allowing the, the creation of this, what I've called Mordor, the, the, from the Lord of the Rings. Uh, and I said that at a press conference in Edmonton, one of the oil industry people said, well, it's not as bad as Mordor. And I thought, well, I won. I mean, what, how bad? Half as bad as the end of everything? I mean... Idea City, the smartest people, the biggest ideas. Understanding and discussion of the water crisis today is where awareness of climate change was five years ago. Where's Matt Barlow? Hi, Matt. Thank you. Yeah, nice to meet you. Thank you very much, Moses. You make getting older cool. I'm a cool grandma. All right, here's the story of what we've done to water. Our population increased or tripled uh, by three, tripled by three, grew by three times in the last century, but our use of water grew sevenfold. And that is that as we urbanize and we get so-called more sophisticated and more technologically sophisticated and we consume more, we're using exponentially more water. We're also polluting water, and many, many places in the world now have water so polluted that they're turning to groundwater, and they're mining that water much faster than it can be replenished. 75% of India's surface water, 75% of Pakistan's surface water, 90% of China's surface water, so polluted it shouldn't be used, but of course people do. 677 major lakes in India all dying one way or another from depletion or um, overextension or pollution or a combination of all. So as we deplete the groundwater, we're taking one of the last remaining sources in the world and we're pumping it out of the ground many, many times faster than it can, it can be replenished. India has 23 million bore wells going 24-7. And a group of scientists in the UK said there's coming anarchy in India as the exponential abuse of this water ends up in dry valleys where suddenly there was one, one day there's water, suddenly the next day there's not. Uh, we're also paving over what's called water retentive landscape, and this is uh, where we take down the trees and we take down, the, take down and out the, the wetlands and we take away the gr grasses that are needed for the small hydrologic cycle over our land. And we shouldn't think of it as one large hydrologic cycle, but rather that water circulates sort of in the area. And when we remove the right <clears throat> or the ability of that water to come back to that place by creating desert, it's like the rain falling on a great big cement umbrella and it goes into the ocean. We also are extracting our rivers literally to death. Most of the major rivers no longer reach the ocean. Those are very important spawning grounds for aquatic life um, because we're over-extracting them for flood irrigation, for industrial-type farming. And one of the big issues is how, how we're going to change our food production methods um, to stop destroying so much water. And then the last thing we do is that we move massive amounts of water by pipeline into great big cities. And if those cities are any anywhere near the ocean, we consider that water garbage when we're finished with it and we dump it in the ocean. Scientists I'm working with uh, figure that we're sending about 170 trillion liters of water. We're displacing that amount every single year from lakes, rivers, and aquifers. This isn't water that's normally flowing into the ocean. From the land into the ocean, and we're creating desert. China, for its economic miracle, is using its water to produce running shoes and toys and all of that, misplaced and displacing by pipeline water from uh, where it is needed for the healthy functioning of a healthy hydrologic cycle, and it's creating an area of desert the size of Rhode Island every single year. So we have what some 
people are referring inaccurately to as drought. But I want to say here tonight as strongly as I can, the climate change question we've only got half right. We understand that the greenhouse gas emission effect is very powerful and it impacts water, melting glaciers, evaporation, lower snowpacks and all of that. What we have not put into the equation is how much what we are doing in our displacement and abuse and pollution of water is actually draining the land of the water that's needed for this healthy hydrologic functioning and to temper the temperatures um, and, the, and the, the earth that's warming up um, as we speak. So it's, uh, uh, one of my missions really is to try to put that, uh, this equation in, in the, the climate change debate. As a result of this, we have a situation where around the world we have what some scientists are calling hot spots or hot stains. And these are places that you will hear have, have drought, and that's a hopeful word because at the end of drought might come non-drought, right? The rains can come back. But that's not what's happening in many places. As we remove the water, we are draining the land and the, and the rain is going away. And we have uh, running out of water, hot stains in the Middle East, in 22 countries in Africa, um, northern China, southern India, all around the Mediterranean. People don't think of it as an area, but it is in crisis. Australia has hit the water wall, the river. Murray Darling no longer reaches the ocean and it's dying from the mouth up, but they will not stop extracting that river. It is now 80% over extracted and growing. Uh, Mexico City is sinking on itself. The American Southwest, Texas, uh, Florida, all in crisis. And so we have a world running out of clean water and we are about to add, before the population peaks, another three billion people. So we have a very serious crisis. The crisis is the deepest impact on humans, in, in my opinion, of anything that we're dealing with. It is the first face of, of climate change. And the inequity that we're, we're facing when we see people with no water is the most visible sign of inequality, the most profound sign of inequality in our world. When you could go to a place and blocks away from opulence and people with swimming pools and golf, golf courses and all of the water that they don't even need but want and across from a river with cholera alongside it are, are townships that have you know half a million to a million people in them with no running water, rats in the gutter, um, you know, absolute pit latrines for, for bathrooms and you have to pay to use those. I mean, those are the privileged people who can use those. This face of inequality is a very profound one. We also know that we're going to be having more conflicts around water as water becomes a national security issue between countries who now are beginning to see water the way they see energy and figuring if we're running out, we better think about where we need to get our water in the future. China is building a pipeline to the Tibetan Himalayas and is going to help itself to water that now feeds all the mighty rivers of Asia. If you want to see a coming conflict, you're going to see a water conflict between China and India. I predict this unless something is dramatically changes um, in, in that area. We're also going to see conflict, and already are, between massive cities that are reaching further and further and further into, the, into indigenous communities, into rural communities to take the water they to need, and in many cases take it by force. And one of the images that I now have in my mind around water sources is big fortresses with armed guards and barbed wire and dogs protecting these precious water sources. Think of it as kind of mining of water, like gold mine or diamond mines, only this is much more precious than energy, gold, diamonds, or anything on Earth. This is life-giving and we have no substitute. And more and more there's going to be conflict around it unless we find a way to make it, as I call it, nature's gift to us, to teach us how to live with each other um, more peacefully and more lightly on the Earth. When we come back... We have to respect nature. We have to go back and protect and restore watersheds. If we don't do that, nothing else will matter. We have to stop polluting, and we have to be strict with those who pollute. Get the latest Idealist news, presenter information, and watch streaming video at www.ideacityonline.com. Idea City, the smartest people, the biggest ideas. We also have huge conflicts around now the question of who owns water, who gets to make the allocation. I've been very involved in the fight against allowing the creation of a corporate cartel for water, 
where big corporations come in and make decisions about water and make decisions about who gets it. In the Global South, the World Bank has basically enforced privatization of services, utilities, in many poor countries, and the countries do not get funding unless they're prepared to take the World Bank's funding uh, and its, its direction, which is usually Suez or Veolia, the two biggest companies in the world, both from France. These companies come in and they deliver water on a for-profit basis, and so they have to jack up the price of water, and if you can't pay, you die. And there have actually been water wars in Cochabamba, uh, Bolivia. There were people killed. The army was brought in to enforce one of these contracts. The people won in the end, in fact, and, it, and, the, and the company was forced to leave. We have big fights over the issue of bottled water. You may think that's a benign issue, but when you stop and think that in the world last year, and this is a very conservative estimate, we put about 250 billion liters of water in plastic around the world. Only 5% of that gets recycled. Huge amount of energy, huge amount of greenhouse gas emissions, the stuff is transferred all over the place. It's a form of collective insanity if you have clean water, which we do here. Uh, and by the way, in Ontario, we, we dump about 750 million plastic bottles just from water alone, unrecycled, every single year, in, year into our rivers and, and wetlands and our dump sites. And let me tell you, when you hear about, oh, Canada, aren't we better and aren't we much, don't we, don't, aren't we better than the rest of the world? <clears throat> the only difference between us and Australia is that we have more water to waste. We have equally bad policies. We have not... Uh, brought in a new law federally for 40 years. We have no national drinking water standards. Uh, we have not mapped our groundwater, so we don't know if the water takings that we're allowing are acceptable. We send out huge amounts of water in what's called virtual trade. That's the water that you use to produce something like grain or livestock or whatever, then you, you ship out of the country. We're a net exporter of our water. Um, we, have, we have a water heritage um, that is actually quite bad in the sense of we think that it's so special, but we have what I call the myth of abundance. And let me tell you, the Great Lakes are sick and need help. Uh, the water situation in northern Alberta is appalling. We are allowing the destruction of the Athabasca River with the production of heavy oil, all to go to the United States under our NAFTA um, uh, restrictions and, and, and uh, equip, uh, um, uh, commitment that we made under NAFTA to ship a certain amount of energy to the U.S., and we cannot cut that. So we are now going to this heavy oil. For every barrel of oil that's produced, three barrels of water are so destroyed that they're held in great big poison holding tanks. And they're so poisonous that if the uh, aquatic life, the ducks or the geese or anything land on them, they die immediately. Uh, we're working with people in Fort Chippewan up there who are dealing with cancer clusters in four-year-olds because we are allowing the, the creation of this, what I've called Mordor, the, 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 from the Lord of the Rings. Uh, and I said that at a press conference in Edmonton, one of the oil industry people said, well, it's not as bad as Mordor. And I thought, well, I won. I mean, what, how bad? Half as bad as the end of everything? I mean... <clears throat> What basically, I, I'm going to just give you th what I call three large practical principles upon which I think we have to build a water-secure future. The first is we have to respect nature. We have to go back and protect and restore watersheds. If we don't do that, nothing else will matter. We have to stop polluting, and we have to be strict with those who pollute. Martin Luther King said legislation may not change the heart, but it will restrain the heartless. We must restrain the heartless who would poison our water systems, and I think that they commit very grievous crimes indeed. We have to capture rainwater, capture stormwater. We have to conserve. We have to uh, grow our food differently. We're probably going to move back to more local production. You're not probably not going to have those steroidal strawberries in January, and it's probably a good thing. <laughs> We're going to have to change our way of living on this earth, and we are going to have to protect those systems absolutely fiercely. If we do not do this, we will not be here. Secondly, we need to say that water is a commons and a public trust, and it does not belong to anyone, or rather, it belongs to all of us. It belongs to other species, it belongs to the ecosystem, and it belongs to future generations who have as much right to it 
as we do. And they have a claim on it, and we should be hearing their voices, as Aboriginal people tell us, seven generations in advance. We need to be hearing those voices. And I'm working with jurisdictions around the world that are actually passing legislation that say, okay, once we protect this water as <clears throat> in watersheds and we make sure our ecosystem's healthy so the hydrologic cycle can function, and then once we move next to a public trust doctrine and a commons doctrine, then we're going to set out priorities for how we're going to do this. And how we're going to do this is that we're going to say there are priorities on this water. And you've got to think of water almost like your bank account. There's your capital, and then there's your investment. And you'd rather live on your investment. You don't want to be drawing down that capital. So if we're going to protect those lakes, oceans, the, sorry, lakes, rivers, and aquifers, we have got to be living more lightly on the earth, and we've got to be living profoundly differently. The third is the notion of equality. And um, I want to say very strongly that while it's important to do, you know, to go in and build wells and all of that kind of thing, what we really need in the world is justice, not charity. We need to build systems that question the very nature of the kind of system that we have built that has created such imbalance in our world, where some people are so wealthy and some people have so little. And it isn't just a question of luck or where you were born, it actually is a system that's been imposed. We can no longer have this notion of what I call savage capitalism, and I am not against the market, but I believe that everything has gone crazy. And we're now going to, are we going to trust to our water the same people who did to our finances what has happened. The total deregulation of this system cannot happen. But that's what, we, what we're seeing, is those who would put water on the open market for sale, like running shoes or Coca-Cola, and they actually want it to be, uh, you know, have a rise and fall, like commodity prices, like, like gasoline. And, and you remember, you know what it's like when you don't know from day to day what gasoline's going to cost. When we come back... We're successful in kicking Coca-Cola out of a little town, little village called Plachamata in southern India where they come in and drained the water and it went all this way to the Supreme Court. They took on the poorest tribal people in the world who just had so much courage. Great ideas are meant to be shared. Join the discussion on Facebook. Idea City. The smartest people, the biggest ideas. One of the things we're seeking at the United Nations is a covenant or a treaty on the right to water that would say once and for all that it is not okay for some to appropriate water for private property and private profit while others are dying uh, for lack of, of water. And let me tell you, to watch your child die that way is the worst. Every eight seconds, somewhere in our world, a child dies of waterborne disease. More than HIV, AIDS, um, uh, war and traffic accidents put together. It's the number one killer, and in every single case, it is, it is avoidable. Let me end by saying that <clears throat> we're building a wonderful water justice movement here in Canada, around the world, based on these notions of respect for nature, watershed restoration, and so on, the notion of, of water as a commons and a public trust, and the notion of water as a fundamental human right, so that no one ever, ever, ever will be denied water uh, for life and for the dignity that it brings. We can do without oil. We cannot do without water. And I would um, ask you and challenge you and invite you to join us. Um, it's a wonderful movement. We've we just uh, were, were successful in kicking Coca-Cola out of a little town, a little village called Plachamata in southern India, where they come in and drain the water, and it went all this way to the Supreme Court. They took on the poorest tribal people in the world who just had so much courage. These women, I sat with them for, for a few days, but they sat for three years every single day in quiet, just mute, just in silent protest against, across from this Coke plant that had, as I say, this image of you know, the guns and the dogs and the barbed wire. Uh, and at the end, uh, were successful because they believed so deeply. Or with the people of Colombia, who have got three million signatures on a plebiscite to get a referendum um, that water is a human right because so many people are dying there. And their government had to receive this uh, agreement, they had to receive this because by law they had to, and then they gutted it. And there was such a fight back, and we fought with them all across the world that the government just changed its mind. So we are having phenomenal success in communities around the world, and I'd urge you to become what I call a water steward. 
And I just want to end by, I have my Tolkien, Tolkien theme tonight, um, the Mordor theme of, of the, the Tar Sands, um, to call us to think about, you know, I, I think about the water issue being like the comet, you know, the movies where the comet's coming at the earth, and uh, all of a sudden nothing matters because in 72 hours it's going to blow up, so suddenly our differences don't seem to matter so much, and religion doesn't seem to matter quite as much, and... I don't know, they send Tom Cruise or somebody up to blow it up. I always think, leave him up, take the wife but, and the kid. But we have a comet coming at us. It's called the global water crisis. I started and I'll end with this. We are a planet running out of water. The Earth is running out of clean water. Forget everything you learned as a child. We're running out of clean water. Please become a steward with us. And let me end. This is Gandalf. Facing that night, you remember if you've read the book or seen the film, when all goodness, all of life, all of nature may end, and they have to put everything against this evil. And he says this, The rule of no realm is mine, but all worthy things that are in peril, as the world now stands, those are my care. And for my part, I shall not wholly fail in my task if anything passes through this night that can still grow fair, or bear fruit and flower again in the days to come. For I too am a steward. Did you not know? Thank you. Mark. Thank you, sweetie. You're sexy, John. <laughs> I'm an Idea City virgin. <laughs> well, I don't live here, so it's a little harder to get here unless you're asked to come and speak. I live in Ottawa, but it is fabulous. I've heard it's fabulous, and it's fabulous. It's, it, you just explode with the ideas and the challenge of getting up there and being not better than anybody, but you want to be as good as everybody else, you know, because the, 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 um, the, ga the gauntlet's thrown down with the quality of speakers, and you just want to be there, you know. That's great. Oh, you can hold your brain tag up with the right hand? Yeah, I love it. Oh, yeah, that's good. Okay. Thank you, Mark. It's a pleasure seeing you.